right. Good afternoon. Let's see, we have everybody on board. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Akila Shirelles. I am the president of the Newark Community Street Team, uh, the city of Newark's community-based public safety initiative, um, and the new executive director of the first ever National Association of Community-Based Public Safety Practitioners. Um, today, we're joined by two of the most progressive mayors in the country, uh, Mayor Ras J. Baraka and Mayor Garcetti, and the premier community-based public safety experts in the country um, to announce um, the first ever National Association of Community-Based Public Safety Practitioners um, to improve public safety in cities. Um, in 1992, I, along with key community members from public housing in Watts, um, was instrumental in organizing a historic peace treaty between the Crips and the Bloods, who were engaged in an internecine war that saw homicides rise to over 1,100 murders in the city and some 1,500 murders in the county. Um, the public health impact on urban communities across the country was epidemic. Um, residents suffered traumatic stress disorder, hypervigilance, and vicarious trauma. But because many of the victims um, and perpetrators were black and brown youth and young adults, and we still live in a society built on systemic racism, implicit bias, and structural violence, our cries seem to fall on deaf ears. Instead of system approaching uh, the issue of gang violence through a public health frame um, and providing healing and recovery services, the system approached it with a criminal justice solution. Um, and you know, the collateral impact of that was, um, was unbelievable. So as fathers and mothers and activists and organizers, we took safety of the community in our own hands. And so for a decade, um, our, our, our peace effort drove violence down in the city of LA. Um, LA adopted our strategy some years later of high-risk intervention, um, also known as interrupters or, or crisis interventionists, um, assertive outreach, um, which happens in the form of safe passage and mentoring through a case management model, and victim services that helps to pay for funerals and lost wages. And um, th those systems are so important in terms of when we're talking about community-based public safety, because it's not a single um, thing that, that happens in communities, right? It's a coordinated um, strategy. Um, in 2000, between 2009 and 2019, um, we saw almost 10 consecutive years in a row of de decreases in violent crime in LA. LAPD consistently credited community-based public safety practitioners um, who had these organizations um, under the city's gang reduction youth development program as key partners in those reductions. However, very little investment um, came into, those, um, into our work until Mayor Garcetti was elected. So what is community-based public safety? Um, we used to call it gang intervention, but today we define ourselves as community-based public safety. The public execution of George Floyd created an inflection point um, in this country. Never again should we view police as a single point of contact for safety in black and brown communities. Safety is a shared strategy and law enforcement is one aspect of the solution because you literally can't have public safety without the public, right? So today, it's about lifting up these complementary strategies in this atmosphere of reimagining public safety. So this work is 25 years in the making. So community-based public safety associations, um, the, the association will be comprised of key leaders and organizations representing um, major US cities, connecting efforts from across the country to help advance pathways to safety that complement policing and reform the criminal justice system, system at a national scale. Community-based public safety, um, um, the, the community-based public safety organ, uh, association will work to secure um, increased funds and build the capacity of these initiatives. This work is not willy-nilly. Um, there's standard operating procedures and protocols um, that already exist. Um, we work at the intersection of public health and public safety, which are essential to achieving and reimagining safety, um, especially in black and brown communities. As a part of our effort, um, the association will educate policymakers, elected and appointed leaders and the public about the critical role that community-based public safety organizations play in reducing violence while working to professionalize the sector's workforce through employment benefits and professional development. And so to ignite um, the effort, um, the association is releasing this national study, um, Redefining Public Safety in America, um, a scan looking at the over 200 um, efforts that are happening in multiple cities across the country um, it details the various um, uh, you know, uh, 
workings of the program, um, how they work to reduce violence, and what is needed to scale them. Um, the timing of the report provides cities that are grappling with the increase of violence due to the pandemic uh, with a roadmap for effective strategies to reduce violence and create healthy and safe communities at a fraction of the cost um, of traditional criminal justice and policing. You can download the report um, or just read the executive summary at www.cbpscollective.org. Again, it's www.cbpscollective.org. Um, today, um, the association launched with the support of Newark Mayor Rash J. Baraka and LA Mayor Eric Garcetti's, whose administrations have invested um, important and significant seed funding um, in community-based public safety approaches in their respective cities. Today, the mayors and the coalitions of, our, um, of organizations involved with, uh, with community-based public safety, uh, we're calling cities and states and federal officials to dedicate resources, including newly received funds from the American Rescue Plan, to, to invest in these um, community-based alternatives, right? I mean, um, complementary strategies and initiatives, um, like those outlined in the report. Um, examples include the Newark Community Street Team, Cure Violence Global, Advanced Peace, the, um, the Urban Peace Institute, the Professional Community Intervention Training Institute, which have all demonstrated, um, have all been demonstrated to increase public safety and reduce violence um, through a coordinated response with law enforcement. Um, so now, um, just want to share a few logistics. We're going to have, you know, both uh, Mayor Baraka and Mayor Garcetti to share a few words, and then we're going to invite um, the practitioners um, to share a little bit about the respective work that they're doing in multiple cities across the country. Um, so now I'd like to introduce, you know, uh, Mayor Rash J. Baraka, the 40th uh, mayor of the, of the great city of Newark, born and raised in the South Ward, um, Mayor Baraka, as a community activist, was instrumental in organizing the historic peace treaty between the Crips and Bloods in Newark in 2004. His leadership on the city council introduced violence as a public health issue to the city, and his ingenuity and creative genius seeded, the, uh, seeded NCST, his community-based public safety initiative, as a key element of his coordinated public um, safety strategy that has produced five consecutive years in a row of decrease of a homicide and overall violence. Um, I want to introduce Mayor Rash J. Baraka. Thank you, Akila. Uh, Mayor Garcetti, good to see you. Um, and, and all of the folks that are on this uh, phone, Dr. Bashir, everybody that are doing, that are on the ground doing the work every day, uh, that really needs all of the credit for the work that's happening in these communities uh, around the country. Uh, I, I would like to applaud Akila, uh, obviously, in his efforts uh, to take what's been happening in municipalities and different parts of this country and trying to elevate it to a national uh, kind of model in terms of organ organizing and getting the, the, White, the White House to uh, begin to push uh, you know, efforts around this uh, violence as a public health issue discussion, which I think now has gained the proper momentum uh, to the point where people are at least discussing this uh, concept, uh, even at, on the wake of uh, the shooting, mass shooting that we've just seen and we continue to see uh, these kind of shootings exist in our community normally. Uh, we end the year uh, uh, in some cities with hundreds of people who have died from guns and guns uh, access in our community. Uh, by the grace of God and the work that we've been doing in Newark, we've been able to reduce uh, violence in our city uh, with a concerted and coordinated effort from uh, targeted policing, but also through the strategies of groups like the Newark Community Street Team and other efforts uh, along those lines that seek to treat violence as public health uh, and begin to look at it through a larger lens uh, and use other alternative strategies to help reduce violence. I also see it as an opportunity to move us along the, the, the realm of social justice uh, and relieving some of the tension and stress that police have with communities. Usually police departments are, are tasked with uh, being in communities to solve kind of social and ills that have, have been uh, in our community for decades. Uh, and they're just not equipped to do so. And some of them come uh, with uh, the, the lack of training uh, and sensitivity uh, to be able to deal with these communities in the first place. Uh, and some of them are just outright racist. And so they need the, uh, you know, we need to re reduce uh, the relationship or how many times did the police need to be dealing with our community, particularly in a negative way. And I think with community organizations helping to reduce violence and crime, uh, it is a logical way to begin to uh, divert funding 
from or police organizations to other opportunities uh, because you reduce the need to have a cop on every corner. Last thing is if you look at neighborhoods that are that are quote unquote safe neighborhoods, these are not neighborhoods with uh, proliferation of police on every corner. These are not neighborhoods that have this kind of interaction with police departments. These are neighborhoods with solid families, uh, with jobs that are available, with decent e educational systems, where social services are provided, where the community has the resources that it needs to deal with the issues that it has uh, in, it, in our community. Uh, and so what we're talking about is stronger opportunity to make our city safer based on what makes cities safe, period. And that's uh, strong families, strong neighborhoods, good jobs, you know, opportunity, all of those things. And if we start focusing on that and, and focusing on the reason that crime uh, is always intractable and violence intractable in these communities, we can begin to treat it as, as public health. Uh, and all of the work that these folks are involved in, I support a million percent and believe uh, that the efforts that we've been uh, encountering in Newark uh, are a direct result of this kind of work. And the last piece is the Office of Violence Prevention and Trauma Recovery, which is the material iteration of all of the things that we've been thinking about and trying to figure out uh, since I was the deputy mayor uh, decades ago. Uh, and, and this is the birth, uh, and, and it was elevated without a shadow of a doubt because of the death of George Floyd, it expedited it. It pushed it further to the front uh, and it gave us the, the room to do exactly what we needed to be done, what we knew needed to be done in the first place. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to share that, Akila. And, uh, you know, I, you, you know I'm, I support this 100% and whenever you need me, I'm here. Yes, sir. I appreciate you, Mayor, and all of the great work that you continue to do um, as a real leader of this movement. Um, next, I want to I want to introduce, uh, you know, uh, my mayor. Um, Lifelong resident of the of the city of uh, of LA, um, you know, his his um, his life work has been so deeply invested in, in in the core values of justice and dignity and equality for people. Um, you know, the mayor's leadership has increased investment in community-based public safety from seven mil several million dollars um, since his coming into office. Um, Grid still stands as one of the country's leading um, community-based public safety initiatives in the country. Um, with a long history of decreases in violence and overall crime. Um, I want to introduce the, the 42nd mayor of the city of Los Angeles, uh, Mayor Eric Garcetti. Well, thank you, Akila. Thank you for your amazing friendship, amazing work, and the uh, angel that you are in this city of angels. And your wings spread out across this country. And it's an always an honor to be with my brother, Mayor Baraka, uh, who's really leading the country out of Newark um, and leading Newark for the country. Um, the incredible work you have done to bring parties together, the reconciliation work between those who police and those who have been policed, um, and the cutting edge work you're doing on everything from basic income to um, economic justice. It's great to be with you. And this is a really exciting day for me. I can't hold back my enthusiasm because, you know, we uh, know that people are dying. We know that violence is up. We know that guns are omnipresent, as we saw this week and last week. And we know that what little gains that had been made in health and wealth, COVID has kind of thrown out the window when it comes to communities of color. We saw a historic call on the streets of America that enough is enough and don't just keep reforming. It is time to completely change the way that we look at things and to do that with all parties present. And I think Akil, you've always brought a spirit that you can't do this one group. A revolution only comes when the entire nation comes together and recognizes this is practical as well as moral work. Um, and just as the White House pushed us under President Obama to reimagine to think about 21st century policing, this is kind of the next chapter of this. This is 21st century community safety. And you can't bring community safety from the outside in. It has to be grown from the inside out and spread from a model that is always community-based, which is why the Community-Based Public Safety Association really is what this country needs right now. And I urge folks who are funders, I urge folks that are cities looking at this to participate in this movement because it is much more than a report. This is the tip of the spear of a movement. Um, you know, we say that you can't count those who are lost. And I know Keila, you know that um, so deeply, sorry, you can only count those that are lost. You can't count those that are safe because when you save a life, you don't know who it is. We can only count those who we have lost. 
But you know what we've done with the Gang Reduction Youth Development Program, something since 2007 that has been at the heart of Los Angeles' public safety strategies, is we actually have quantified the number of lives, even if we don't know the specific ones, that have been saved. It is the most important work we can do to save a human life, let alone hundreds of human lives, the way that we have with our academic partners uh, brought together after building an infrastructure that comes from the community, is with the community, and that really focuses on the needs of community. Because a, a model that is only police and police first will fail. Police officers know this in enlightened cities, as well as community members. And we've put so much, we can't just blame police officers, though when there's culture and acts, we do need to blame and hold accountable police departments and officers. But we collectively own that guilt by throwing everything on them, on their shoulders to resolve mental health, on their shoulders to resolve homelessness, on their shoulders to resolve suicide, when we have much better solutions uh, that are right there in our community. So what we've been doing is we've taken a comprehensive approach in Los Angeles, uh, one that I started as council president and have expanded uh, as mayor. In fact, we've expanded our gang reduction youth development intervention work by 50% since I've been mayor. We certainly haven't grown our police department by 50%. And I think the police officers can appreciate that this work means something that they don't have to respond to when it's successful. We have youth development, prevention, intervention, youth re-entry and diversion services that are community-based, culturally proficient, family-centered, and data-informed with a trauma-based approach as the underlying philosophy. It's wraparound services for young people. Once we get somebody in our system, a different sort of system than the criminal justice system, we don't ever want want to lose them. We want to find out their family needs. We want to hear their, what their trauma is and treat it. We want to give them counseling, job training, referrals. We want to build a pathway of success for them. And it puts this work in the hands of people who have lived experience. It's not experts coming from outside in. Again, you cannot build community safety from the outside in. These are folks from the neighborhood, people who have served time, who have been criminally justice involved, who have struggled, who have faced trauma, and who can connect with a young person in a way that other people cannot. Recent study shows this works. Our grid workers prevented 109 gang-related retaliatory homicides and 349 such deadly assaults in four years, just four years. There are men and women who are now graduating from high school and college today. They're tucking a child into bed. They're volunteering in their communities. They have better jobs. And we've got to professionalize this profession as well, just as we do with law enforcement officials to have union jobs and people who are government employees and a career that people can make of this. And Akila, I appreciate your advocacy on that as well. This has to be about basic income. It has to be about reparations. It has to be about free college. This has to be about free transit. This has to be about higher minimum wage. It has to be about the right to healthcare and the right to housing. None of this is in a vacuum. But even this past year when cities like LA saw a rise in gun violence and in homicides, even as overall crime went down, we saw a 9% decrease in the toughest year we faced in a decade in gang-related violent crime in our grid zones compared to 2019. That is a miracle in a year like this that I hope will be an outlier and not a new normal. Our vision is not just the absence of violence, it is the presence of peace and the presence of justice. So I thank you, Akila, for breathing that peace, breathing that justice onto the streets of America Count on us to be there with you. And I challenge every mayor in every city in America to join us in this movement. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor. Um, as you all can see, this is why Mayor Garcetti, Mayor Baraka are the most progressive mayors in the country um, in terms of their investment, in terms of their understanding um, of this work. I mean, it's been you know, phenomenal to work in partnership with both of you um, in terms of standing up the association of rolling it out the report, but more importantly, yeah. Um, in helping to really change the narrative around public safety in this country, that, um, that it's not just about law enforcement and procedural justice trainings and de-escalation strategies, that it's about expanding, you know, this, this um, conceptual view that includes like the people, right, in the public safety um, efforts that we do. Um, next, I, I'd like to um, introduce, you know, um, the premier professionals in the country who, who bring this work to, to multiple cities. Um, and so first I'd like to introduce, um, you know, the, the co-author of the report, um, you know, Melvin Hayward um, of Chicago Cred. Um, Mel has a long history of doing community-based intervention, was in instrumental in organizing the peace treaty between the Venice shorelines and, um, and B-13s um, in, in, um, in Venice, where he grew up. 
21 years on the front line doing this work, um, established to Helper Foundation, a key you know, um, player in terms of um, LA um, community-based public safety work. Um, I wanna introduce my brother, Melvin Hayward, who is the, uh, the head of uh, programs at Chicago Cred. Thank you, brother Keela. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here today uh, just to talk about this community-based public safety work. I think it's very, very important that we prop up this conversation today as we continue our efforts in reducing gun-motivated violence across this country. And um, what I'll say about Chicago Cred is we were founded in 2016 uh, by our, our manager, Arnie Duncan. Um, and our primary focus is to reduce gun violence in a transformative way. And our primary target is serving young men and women at the highest risk of being shot or shooting somebody. And so we primarily provide services in two communities in Chicago. One is Roseland on the south side and the other is North Lawndale. And we average upwards of about 250 participants served on a yearly basis. We have a team of close to 100 individuals. Um, we, we have a five pillar system and the first pillar is outreach, which is the tip of the spear. Individuals who are providing conflict mediation and resolution in the community, building a, a rapport with key players that are involved in group and gang violence, and those that have a license to operate to provide phenomenal services into the community that are needed in those violent communities uh, in Chicago. Our second pillar is uh, our life coaching and mentoring piece where we, where we uh, provide the mentorship for individuals who are enrolled in our program to help them start the process of changing their mindset. We know that in order to reduce violence in our communities, we have to change the mindset of an individual that ultimately leads to the change in behavior. And so our life coaches are individuals who have come from the lifestyle, changed their lives and are committed to working with young men and women to transition away from the life. Our third pillar is our clinical piece. And so we have a team of therapists who are indigenous to the communities that we serve. Uh, who are committed to transforming uh, those individuals that we're working with, with trauma stress management sessions, with cognitive behavioral interventions. And their primary role is to reduce the trauma and the harm that our participants have been dealt with. Uh, our fourth pillar is our education pillar. What we realize is that in order for our young men and women to transition successfully, education is a critical element. And so to date, We've graduated over 150 young men and women and, and they've received their high school diplomas. And we have about a dozen who are currently enrolled in college uh, trying to receive, go after their BA and or AA. And then, you know, our last pillar, which we believe is extremely important is our employment and training pillar. And so, you know, what we believe is economic stability is a basic human right and key component of any fulfilling lifestyle. And this final stage of our program focuses on development and utilizing skills needed to establish and maintain gainful employment. And so when we talk about uh, resources, we know that that's a critical element in our community. And so we have to prepare our young men and women for what it means to transition as an entrepreneur or go after meaningful employment. And so with this wraparound approach, what we found is that number one, that we've, we've identified the right individuals in the community who are engaged in the highest risk behavior. And through this 18 month process of us working with these young men and women, we found that people exit our program successfully with a, a higher understanding of themselves and understanding what non-aggression agreements mean in their community because that's a critical piece of this work is reducing violence, but giving folks a chance to understand what it feels like to, to have aggression between those groups that they've been, been warring with. And then ultimately our ultimate goal is, is peace agreements. And so I would say that we've had some level of success I would be a fool to say that we've done a great job in Chicago. We've had uh, a lot of issues with violence and death. We were close to 800 homicides in 2020, but I'll say in closing that uh, we have unified the workforce. We are working collaboratively with CP4P and Ready Chicago and Chicago Cred. 
and we look forward to a successful 2021. And Chicago Cred is dedicated to the community-based public safety strategy, and we stand firm with everybody on this call. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melvin, um, for sharing that very important framing. Um, next, I'd like to um, introduce my brother, uh, Dr. Gary Slutkin, um, President and CCO of Cure Violence Global. Um, Gary is a physician and epidemiologist, received his MA from the University of Chicago and completed his residency um, in, 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 um, in uh, infectious disease work, right? Um, credited um, with uh, providing this um, kind of scientific and um, important framing around community-based public safety. Um, in 2000, he founded Cure Violence Global, um, which had achieved 40 to 70% drops in violence and sometimes even 100% utilizing these models. Dr. Gary Slepkin. Uh, thank you, Akila. And um, it's wonderful to be with uh, uh, Mayors Baraka and Garcetti. I, I met with um, you, Mayor Baraka, maybe 15 years ago. I don't know if you recall. And um, Mayor Garcetti, um, you brought me into Los Angeles in 2005 or six. Um, uh, Cabrera Stokes facilitated this and you were one of the first in the whole country to really um, want to do this as um, the way to go, this being of the public health approach. And it's so interesting because um, from that moment of 2005 and 2006, LA and New York really picked this up. And Newark has now picked this up in a very um, big way. But um, Chicago, which is where we originated, fought this at every step throughout um, these years. And the differences and results are, are available for everybody to see. Let me just back off a little bit here and um, say that I'm also really very excited to be with Akila and Akil and Melvin and David and Fernando and Julius. These are really um, super leaders in this field, to say the least. And there's a lot of leaders in this field now, which is really great. I'm, uh, as Akila mentioned, I'm, I'm a physician. I'm a World Health Organization epidemiologist. Um, I've worked in other fields. Violence is um, the last of, I think the last of several fields that I've worked in, I, I ran the tuberculosis program for San Francisco in the 80s. I lived in Somalia. I, I, I worked on TB and cholera there, and I worked in AIDS and ran the innovation unit for the World Health Organization, uh, primarily for Asia and Africa. And I came back to the US in um, the 90s and um, basically to take a break. I didn't know so much about the violence problem, but it was we felt surrounded by it. I'd been away from America for a long time, and um, I was shocked by what Amer not only the problem, but the way that America was dealing with it. And it was I saw the problem of violence being completely misdiagnosed and completely mistreated. And um, basically using what we would call medieval tactics of punishment, which are simply that. And it's, we're way beyond the science of thinking that punishment has any, anything important to do with the formation or maintenance or, or changing of beha behavior. So we um, saw this completely as an epidemic problem. The charts and graphs showed it the same way. Well, every epidemic, as Mayor Garcetti said, every single epidemic is managed from the inside out. That's the way public health works. That's the way epidemics work. And we began to uh, try um, this approach that has been mentioned here um, and um, first got a 67% drop and then repeated 45% drops. And now there've been 20 studies of Cure Violence's approach in about um, 25 cities. Eight of these have been independent evaluations, 40 to 70% drops and shootings and killings are normal and usual. 100% retaliations are commonly seen. And 13 communities on the East Coast and in Latin America have gone to zero for a year to uh, three years. So this is um, a public health problem. Um, this is a problem of um, behavior that is um, in, in a way learned and contagious. This is public health practice that's being described by Akila and Akil. 
Um, this is a field that really needs to turn this corner fully with the amount of funding and advocacy and support that's being described by this initiative. It's an essential moment to invest big time because um, for one, the violence has gone up enormously in 2020 throughout the country. Secondly, everybody now sees that there is another, um, there's a need for something other than law enforcement with the George Floyd and everything else that everyone can see. And thirdly, people understand epidemics now and outreach and, and behavior because of COVID, but most importantly, because we don't really know where the country's going in the next two years or four years. And this whole thing could be reversed by um, uh, changes in government. And so it's, it's very important to invest right now, stabilize this, sustain this, get this into the cities and states. I'm, I'm back in my World Health role of advising governments that it's, it's time to say, this is real, this is, has plenty of data, and let's turn this corner now. So I'm just very happy to be with this group and to participate and to help in any way that we can scientifically, methodologically, system-wise to make this um, uh, standard practice from now on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Slecker. Next, I'd like to um, introduce um, uh, my, my partner in peace, uh, Dr. Akil Bashir, who um, uh, the Professional Community Intervention Training Institute has um, provided the standard um, operating procedures and protocols for NCST's team um, for the past seven years. Um, uh, Dr. Bashir um, uh, hosts the, the nation's first practitioner-based um, a professionally certified um, um, community, being, uh, community intervention training. He's the author of uh, Peace in the Hood, which we literally utilize as the Bible, you know, in Newark, in terms of our, um, our on the ground strategy. Um, and, um, you know, is, is the leader of multiple like kind of key works around um, community sentinel programs um, and comprehensive strategies to reduce violence in the city, Dr. Kilbashir. Uh, good to be here, honored to be here amongst all of you. Uh, really want to salute two of the most progressive mayors in the nation, uh, Garcetti, who we worked with for years, and uh, Mayor Baraka, who we've been working with recently, and it's really just put together an outstanding model, uh, infrastructure of what this look this work should look like uh, with Keela's uh, assistance and direction. So it's really been an honor. All my comrades on the call, much respect to all of you, and I salute all of the, in, the, the, the efforts and the sacrifices uh, that you've uh, made and continue to make to, to serve our community and to serve uh, the people in need. Uh, I've been tasked to talk about one component, uh, and that is uh, the uh, training component. And when we come together and bring a, a collective together like this, we don't have to bring all our tools to the table, and that's the blessing and the benefit. Uh, we all have expertise across the board, uh, but if we can singularize that ex expertise and really provide that which we think is going to best move this collective through collective sacrifice, I think it'll benefit uh, our community uh, far more. In terms of training, you know, <laughs> it's amazing because uh, when we're on the ground and when we hear from our people on the ground, uh, one thing they will echo time and time again, uh, nowhere do we feel safe. And unfortunately, a part of that non-safety uh, is related to the police department. So one of the reasons we created the PCITI, Professional Intervention Training Institute International, was to make sure a variety of things transpired, was to make sure we had uh, individuals who had lived experience, who understood the work, and who had the professionalism to dictate a power base so they can drive and build a community-driven system. Uh, when we put this institute together, together, it was to make sure at the end of the day uh, that uh, those of us that work on the front end knew what we were doing and had the capacity uh, to uh, put the skill sets, put the protocol, put the operational directives in place. Uh, when we think about training, training dictates behavior. 
uh, behavior dictates standards and standards dictate performance. So we wanted to make sure and dispel the myth that you could not bring community members and put them in a position of leadership and they not be the professionals to define what those processes uh, look like. You know, when you look at the community-based public safety collective, our goal is to unify, professionalize, and standardize. One of the things we were able to do uh, with the training institute was make sure we professionalize our people. We provided them the expertise. We provided them the knowledge. We gave them the capacity to operate upfront, then in the moment, and then build in the recovery mechanism because we truly understand a holistic uh, approach is what it takes for community ownership. And the reduction of fear and violence is first. That's why we've got to make sure that we support that. As we build out this nation, and let me be real clear, the reason why I will salute all my comrades and all of us in this work, we built this, uh, this, this movement on uh, band-aids, on glue, and on string. And we've been operating like that for decades. Uh, Gary knows well, I can talk to all my individual, Melvin, Akila knows well, Fernando, all of us know that uh, we've been in this uh, because of the, the passion to make sure our communities were the best they can be. Look, most of us that are on the ground, we understand the trauma. I've been shot, I've been stabbed, I've almost died in this work numerous times. So at the end of the day, I understand not having those systems and those progressive uh, components in place uh, to move the process forward. Uh, if we look at uh, what training does and why training is so important, uh, training qualifies our expertise. Training sets the benchmark of what we represent. Training puts the checks and balances in place and training certifies our people to where they operate from a standard of excellence that cannot be denied. And so when we look back at those of us that are being trained and moving in this process, we are trying to make clear that not only are we a community driven process, we a community driven process with experts who understand the trauma in these communities, experts who have the skills to navigate these communities and experts who understand problematic solution driven systems and processes which would get us to the end of the day and get us the results that we need. Look, if we don't train our communities to be self-reliant and mm -hmm. self-determinant, we defeat the purpose and we got to question why we're in there. So to those of you that are listening to us, please know that we do know what we're doing. We believe in the collaborative process. We want to work with everybody within the public safety system. And one of the things that true training does, especially in this capacity, it gives us an understanding of the public safety protocol. So we operate from the same narrative, but just from a, a community driven perspective as we move the process forward. No, we need assistance. We are not begging for help. What we're saying is if we truly want to meet that end result of making these communities uh, self-reliant, giving the individuals in these communities the hope that they need to move forward and making sure that these communities are, are, are those communities that can speak for themselves and control their own narrative. We've got to work in a collaborative format. We've got to bring all our expertise to the table and we've got to work from a three-pronged process out front in the moment and recovery. So I'll land on this. One of the things I am so pleased with the uh, public safety uh, collaborative and the collective that uh, is being built is that we have brought some of the best to the table. We're willing to learn. We know we don't know it all, but we're creating a system and a process in place that will be superseding in terms of a succession plan for those of us that might transfer out of the work, uh, those of us that want to make sure others behind us know how to replace us, and more importantly, a template for these communities to be able to look to, land on, and drive the process. So get with us, please. We are putting the public back in public safety, and we are serious about what we're doing. I will turn it back over to my illustrious host, uh, Akila Surreal, who is doing outstanding work. Akila. Thank you so much, Commander. Um, appreciate you know the powerful words that you that you shared. Like always, you know, um, you really inspired a whole movement of folks, you know, who at one point um, didn't believe that that our voices that we had the capacity to reduce violence and crime and sustain those reductions in our community. Um, training is so critical and important. Next, I'd like to introduce my brother, um, Fernando Rihan, um, who is the Executive Director of the Urban Peace Institute. Um, the Urban Peace Institute has had a long history in terms of its work in the city of Los Angeles, um, producing a groundbreaking report about 15 years ago about the impact of, of, of violence um, in the city and calling folks um, to stand up and to make a significant investment in this work. 
Um, he's a protege of individuals like Connie Rice, who is one of the most prominent, you know, attorneys in the country. Uh, Dr. Susan Lee, you know, um, their work is um, around research, around violence, um, around the law has been, you know, just, you know, phenomenal, right? Um, and, uh, and, and Fernando, you know, much like them, is following directly in that line. Um, he recently organized um, the, uh, the, the, the LA um, like Violence Intervention Coalition, was instrumental with the group, um, with accessing, um, uh, we call it a small victory because um, we're happy that the mayor was here because we're looking to move more than $56 million that's in the city budget into our respective work. Um, but Fernando was instrumental in helping to facilitate bringing an additional two and a half million dollars um, to community-based intervention. I mean, his leadership is known um, um, and, and felt nationally. I want to introduce my brother, Fernando Rihan. Thank you, Akila. Uh, pleasure being here with, with our mayor, uh, Eric Garcetti and Mayor Baraka, um, and pleasure to be here with, with all of our colleagues. Um, as Akila said, you know, my name is Fernando Rejon. I'm the executive director of the Urban Peace Institute. We implement violence reduction strategies and smart justice solutions to end violence and mass incarceration so families can thrive. Um, for us, we've been um, organizing on the Urban Peace Institute for over a decade, training violence intervention workers at the ground level for over 10 years, training law enforcement across the country on how to police with dignity um, and understand the, how to police um, as part of a larger comprehensive violence reduction strategy. So our work on the ground um, has been deep. Um, I wanted to share with everybody, you know, investment in community-based public safety is essential to broaden the framework for safety in the United States, particularly in communities most impacted by violence and over-policing. Los Angeles has been a national leader in non-traditional community safety efforts under the leadership of Mayor Eric Garcetti via the Office of Gang Reduction and Youth Development, which is now under the, the leadership of uh, Interim Director Reggie Zachary. The city has invested over $250 million over 12 years to provide violence prevention resources directly to the highest need communities and build non-traditional safety infrastructures that rely on leaders with lived experience to create peace in LA's neighborhoods. As the nation reckons with its legacy of racism and current crisis over the mission of American policing, it must be recognized that these communities, these community-based safety strategies have demonstrated significant effectiveness to most importantly save lives and improve safety, but also to significantly decrease wasted dollars on incarceration and over-reliance on policing. LA's gang intervention efforts have been evaluated for effectiveness. A joint UCLA-USC study found that over a two-year period in South LA, gang intervention workers reduced retaliatory violence by 41%. Also in South LA, when a gang-related homicide is responded to by LAPD only, the chance of a retaliatory homicide is 26%. When LAPD plus intervention respond from their separate lane, the chance of homicide drops to below 1%. I'll say that again, the chance for a homicide drops to below 1%, 0.7%. Despite the current surge that we're experiencing in LA and nationally, gang intervention has helped to keep the city safe for the last decade, helping to maintain low rate of violence and death, but we can do more and seek a vision zero plan for gang-related homicides in our city. Street outreach and violence intervention workers across the country continue to shoulder the brunt of three public health crises, the pandemic, gun violence, and demands for racial justice. During the pandemic, LA's peacemakers maintained their primary role as violence interrupters and embraced additional, the additional role as virus interrupters, handing out PPE, food, and credible public health information to address the public health surges. Intervention workers in LA were the only ones in the nation to be classified not only as essential workers, but also emergency personnel for the county health order. The LA Intervention Coalition, comprised of 16 frontline gang intervention agencies and groups, is seeking substantial investment to broaden their role in community-based public safety efforts. For example, going from 120 to 500 intervention worker positions and going from 40 to 250 peace ambassadors, creating a minimum salary of 45,000 a year plus benefits and hero pay, and ensuring access to flexible dollars for innovative responses to address community violence. We support any efforts that will focus on focus resources on building out community-based health and safety ecosystems that does not allow our communities just to survive, but to thrive. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fernando, you know, for sharing all of that and the important like kind of information and facts behind this work. Um, because we have to continue to lift up that this is evidence-based work. This is not willy-nilly work that we're doing, you know, just out in the field. 
that, that we have evidence-based results. We have practitioner-based results. We have community support in terms of our work. Now it's time for significant investment. So next I'd like to introduce, you know, my brother, David Muhammad, um, the executive director of the National Institute of Criminal Justice Reform. Uh, David has been a leader in the field of criminal justice, violence prevention, and youth development for a number of years. His work um, has transformed the juvenile and criminal justice system. Um, you probably know his work uh, most through um, the city of Oakland um, with Oakland United. They were instrumental in moving and, and doing a, um, I mean, this was just revolutionary, um, doing a, um, a ballot initiative that moved almost eight to $10 million um, you know, um, through city taxes to support um, community-based public um, um, safety infrastructure in the city. Um, so I, I want to, with that, I want to introduce my brother, David Mohammed. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Akila, and really appreciate you for uh, this opportunity to participate in this extraordinary network uh, and really all of uh, the colleagues here. Uh, these are the folks that I, I know and love and respect and work with uh, throughout the country. Uh, and Akila, you have done a pretty extraordinary job of assembling uh, the, the A team. <laughs> the, uh, really the dream, the dream team of folks uh, doing this work. So I'm, I'm honored uh, to be a part of this group. Um, and, and, and to the mayors uh, who uh, helped lead this effort and who are bold enough to, to work uh, in this way, uh, although, although obvious, meaning this is, where, <laughs> this is where the evidence is, this is what's effective, but really appreciate the leadership of Mayor Baraka, the leadership of Mayor Garcetti uh, uh, across the country, uh, to our two coasts. So uh, just briefly, I think my colleagues have said, uh, really made brilliant comments and assessments. Um, we have years of evidence that community-driven uh, uh, violence reduction, community-driven public safety uh, is effective, is cost-effective, it saves lives, uh, and we know how to implement it well. Um, people who are close to the challenge, close to the problem, uh, people who have similar lived experiences as the individuals they're engaging with. Uh, you know, we might these days call it credible messengers, um, but folks who have lived experiences and can be examples that have credibility, uh, that can lead folks who are deep into their challenges and their risk behavior, uh, could help them come out uh, of that uh, uh, area of risk and not, not only be away from gun violence, but also be successful uh, uh, adults. Uh, we have that knowledge, we have that expertise in cities across the country. Uh, we have folks uh, who do this extraordinary training. Uh, so, and we have the examples of it being effective. You've heard it in, in several cities already. Uh, I'll just give a, a, a just a quick uh, explanation, city of Oakland, at the end of 2012, which was a really bad year in gun violence, decided uh, to engage uh, in this new strategy that, that we call gun violence reduction strategy. Uh, it has it's been called ceasefire. That's a confusing name uh, that needs a lot of explanation often. Uh, so gun violence reduction strategy uh, uh, in the city of Oakland, uh, where we assessed the gun violence problem, did a deep data analysis on who are the folks uh, that are engaged in the gun violence? What's the small number of people uh, who are involved in the vast majority of gun violence? Uh, let's, in a public health approach, so we heard Dr. Slucken say, let, let's inform them of their risk, uh, to inform them, not in any scared straight, not in any we're warning you type of message, in a, hey, we want to let you know you have the risk factors that make you highly likely to be involved in gun violence. Then next, we want to connect you to a community of support. That's going to happen primarily through what we call in Oakland an intensive life coach, right? It might be called an outreach worker or an intervention worker or a case manager somewhere else. But ultimately, all that means is a healthy relationship a, uh, with a positive adult, somebody who has been where you have been, somebody who has turned their life around, and somebody who is not just going to holla at you occasionally, right? But somebody who's going to work with you intensely. Right, somebody who's going to talk to you every single day, see you two, three, four, five times a week, help you uh, with the decision making process in a time of crisis, be there for you, eventually develop a plan of action for you a safety plan, a life plan, a care plan. Uh, and then, yes, connect you to the services that you need. But first, it's about a relationship. 
right? And the real work is about a relationship. I'm going to be in relationship with you. I'm going to be that positive influence with you. Uh, and that's going to help you make better decisions, right? So you use your relationship to have influence. You use your influence to help make better decisions and better decisions lead to better outcomes. So in the city of Oakland, we had seven consecutive years of reductions in shootings and homicides leading to 50% overall reduction in shootings and homicides uh, pre-COVID. You know, we all know the world, uh, something happened. Uh, that was more than just a horrible pandemic of the disease. It was also the explosion uh, of behaviors that led to, to violent increases, largely due, I think it all confirmed our good work because when we, you couldn't have folks on the street in tents, in person, the way we had had them, uh, it had this impact, right? So for instance, in the city of Oakland, 30 people, job full time to have in-person intervention with folks at the highest risk that all went away overnight, uh, right? So just, just two, two examples that I just have to say this, the end of March in Oakland 2020, the city was on a 38% reduction in homicides year to date, coming off of years of that, meaning had we maintained it, that was a full quarter, had we maintained that, it would have been the lowest homicide rate in the city's history, right? Now, we all know what happened at the end of March 2020, right? We ended that year uh, without that consistent uh, reduction, right? Uh, and so now that we're able to get back to it and, and we're finally getting uh, 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 vaccinations in the arms of life coaches and intervention workers and outreach workers, we're getting back to the level. Uh, so we hope to soon be able to have back at that level level of intervention. But we know what's worked in Chicago, in LA, in Newark, uh, in place in Sacramento, uh, we, in places around the country where we're doing uh, doing this work. The last thing I want to say is just the point of money. Uh, Akila mentioned city of Oakland did something bold. Uh, it put forth a ballot initiative to the voters of the city of Oakland. Um, it funds both police at community uh, police activities. So community policing, we can argue about later the effectiveness of the community policing, but it also funds uh, 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 direct services, right? So $9 million a year uh, mm -hmm. in the city of Oakland, a city the size of, 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 five, of uh, 430,000 residents, $9 million a year for violence intervention. There's a separate $17 million a year fund for prevention. You develop. This is all about violence intervention, right? And it goes to community-based, 90% of it goes to community-based organizations doing this type of work. Uh, the funding mechanism is a best practice. Lastly, our organization has funded, uh, uh, assessed a bunch of cities' cost of gun violence. We come into cities, we look at what is that cost of gun violence? What is the cost of taxpayers uh, when uh, we have gun violence, right? And it is at, at, the, at minimum, a million dollars per shoot, uh, yeah. right? And in places like California, which is uh, uh, a very expensive, $2 million per homicide. And so I, I put in the chat for everyone, the website of that, of, of those series of studies that we've done in several cities and continue to do in others. And Akilah, I just appreciate the time and, and to be a part of this great uh, group. Thank you, David, you know, for all of the great work that you do, um, you know, understanding this work from soup to nuts, you know, and then also, um, you know, if you could drop in the chat also the work that you're doing around um, the uh, Office of Violence Prevention Network, um, which is bringing together system leaders across the country, offices of violence prevention and offices of neighborhood safety, providing like infrastructure support to them, because um, as you heard the mayor say, he moved 5% of the city's public safety's budget into a new Office of Violence Prevention that's being headed up by a sister um, uh, Keisha Yuri, and, um, and these agencies become like an intermediary between the city and community-based partners, um, providing strategic investment in that respective work. So, um, you know, um, we're going to be looking for you know ARP to also fund offices of violence prevention in every city in the union. Um, and, straight and up. Just quick um, word first. Thank you. Can't believe I didn't mention that. <laughs> and I did put in the chat the website to the National Offices of Violence Prevention Network. Thank you. And, and last but not least um, is our brother Julius Thibodeau Jr., who is um, who's the, the, the senior um, strategist um, and, and program manager for Advanced Peace Organization out of Sacramento. Um, Julius got his professional start um, as a worker um, teaching life skills instruction, um, working 
working with, uh, with, with a name that has become synonymous with, uh, with community-based violence reduction, Devon Bogan, you know, um, and Sam Bond, right, of the Office of Neighborhood Safety out of Richmond, California. Um, some of you guys probably just heard that, uh, that um, the Advanced Peace model is now being piloted in New York City. Um, just last week, um, uh, uh, the mayor, um, de Blasio, uh, made an announcement that uh, five boroughs or five communities will be receiving, um, will be piloting the Advanced Peace model um, um, in New York City. So with that, I want to introduce uh, my brother, uh, Julius Thibodeau. Thank you, brother Akila. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm clearly the rookie on this team, uh, so I'm truly honored and humbled by being on this panel. Uh, thank you to both our honorable mayors uh, for having me and uh, just the brothers on the team. I wanted to start off by saying and, and pointing out uh, being someone who uh, served a significant amount of time in the California prison system, uh, most of the things and the services that, uh, and I wanna say the branches of knowledge and education that my colleagues have pointed out here that we are giving to these, to these troubled youth and these in individuals at a high risk for, uh, to be the perpetrators or, or potential victims of gun violence. They don't have access to these branches of knowledge. Without these organizations, they wouldn't have CBT, they wouldn't have any cognitive behavioral therapy opportunities, and they wouldn't have the support services. And, and I know for firsthand because I didn't receive these things. When I was in school and I was acting up and I was fighting, uh, I was simply punished or I was threatened with punishment. Uh, never, never knew what it was to even meant to be uh, in an anger management class, uh, emotional intelligence, or any form of conflict resolution. I did receive all those things in prison. They have those things in prison for us. Uh, nowhere, I had never heard of those things. Uh, and I was a free man up until uh, the tender age of 20, 21 years old and never heard of any of those things while I was free. Uh, uh, but I got all those things while I was incarcerated. So uh, very important for us to have those opportunities. I wanted to speak as the brother uh, Keela just pointed out that Advanced Peace is a national organization that utilizes the Peacemaker Fellowship strategy to deliver a vast number of support services to young people who have found themselves at the center of gun violence, whether it be as a potential perpetrator or as a potential victim of gun violence, we seek out this most difficult population to serve. And as my brother David Muhammad said, develop a deep and meaningful relationship with these young men and women. That takes time, money and resources. So as we reimagine public safety programs like Advanced Peace have served as what we like to call the serve to be the the great exposer. And when I say the great exposer, I'm meaning that to date, every city that has invested in public safety by implementing the Peacemaker Fellowship strategy, they have seen also, as the brother said, historical reductions in cyclical and retaliatory gun violence. So imagine if cities, states, and this country as a whole invested in public safety, utilizing strategies other than law enforcement, such as Richmond, California did. I, I would I would uh, gladly say, and I think it's safe to say that the world might be a safer place to live in. For example, cities that are funded funded with the additional Cal VIP dollars experience three times the percentage of gun violence reduction when compared to other cities that are not funded by Cal VIP. We here in Sacramento, we enjoy 28 months of no juvenile homicides, mainly because we were closer closer to being adequately funded in contrast to having absolutely no meaningful investment at all. So in closing, I'd like to remind as many of my colleagues that state that these are evidence-based data-driven programs, uh, proven strategies, or as our young people would love to say, these are the facts and not opinions. Uh, we, want to, uh, we want to love our young people. I think when we talk about investments, I want, I want people to capture the idea that these investments that we're talking about, they embody so much more than just financial support. Uh, we're, we're basically charged with loving and caring for individuals who don't necessarily know how to love and care for themselves. And you know they can't extend that to others until they are given that. And once we, once we do that, then you'll see as, as many of my colleagues have spoke, you'll see the dividends and the rewards 
uh, that we receive from investing in these young people. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone from, for having us here. And uh, it's been an honor and a pleasure. And I hope that uh, we can continue to invest in our young people and see to make that paradigm shift and become uh, productive citizens in society. Thank you so much, Julius. Um, such profound words, brother, and just echoing the sentiments of, of all of the, um, the community-based public safety practitioners and our respective organizations. Um, people would think that um, because we do similar work all across the country that we would be in competition. Um, we don't work from a scarcity mentality. We work from the frame that there is more um, you know, out there than, than we are actually asking for. And so this is why we're forming this national association to come together so that we can leverage our collective voices um, in the halls and in, and, and in um, the federal government, um, along with philanthropy, so that we can move dollars you know, um, to support the long-term sustainability of our work. Um, so this is a movement that's led by impacted people. Um, and, and if you've noticed, um, and this was by design actually, that the individuals that you see here are primarily black and brown men, right? Um, because this work, I would say 90% of it is primarily led by black and brown men, right? There was a study that came out not too, not too long ago that basically said that, that black men are the least helped and the most harmed in our respective communities, the least helped and the most harmed. Now we're not saying in any way that, that our women, that sisters, you know, who are on the front line, who are the vanguards of the black community, straight up, you know, and of the political scene right now are not um, central and intricate, you know, in terms of this work, they are. However, this is a movement. This is a movement that has to be led by black and brown men because 90% of us are the victims and the perpetrators, you know, of the violence that's happening in our community. So Julius, before you say, I'll let you say the final word to take us out. Um, I just want to lift up, um, you know, our sister, uh, Keisha Yuri, you know, that the mayor spoke about celebrated activists in the city of Newark who now heads up the Office of Violence Prevention. I want to lift up our sister, Erica Ford, you know, who's, I mean, you know, 25 years on the front line from life camp um, in the city of New York that was instrumental in helping to set up the whole crisis management system in Newark. I'm going to lift up our sister Pam Johnson from the Jersey City Anti-Violence Coalition, Dr. Lisa Chowry um, of the Patterson Healing Collective, and, you know, our sister Fatima um, um, Lorraine um, Dreyer, who is heading up the Hospital um, Alliance for Violence Intervention Program. These women, as well as many more, you know, are, are central and intricate in terms of this work. So by no means it was um, about disrespect, you know, um, but this was essentially about um, creating a platform so that black and brown men, you know, can actually own the safety narrative in their respective communities, you know, to make our, our community safe. Um, and, and so with that, um, I wanna thank you all for, for your support and participation in today's uh, press event. Um, I wanna give a special shout out um, to the Alliance for Safety and Justice and the National um, Coalition for Shared Safety. Um, you know, we are a partner, you know, of the National Coalition for Shared Safety. We embrace their frame. The Alliance for Safety and Justice is one of the premier criminal, criminal justice reform organizations across the country. Um, Lenore Anderson, Robert Rooks, you know, thank you guys for your leadership. Um, you know, Shakira Diaz, um, my man Jay Jordan. Um, and then also I want to thank Open Philanthropy, uh, Chloe Cockburn, um, for the investment in terms of our uh, ability to be able to, to actually produce the report. Um, and, and now, you know, um, um, supporting the establishment of the Community-Based Public Safety Association uh, nationally. Um, and so Julius, why don't you, uh, you take us out with some final words, brother? Yes, I just was thinking as you were speaking, I definitely uh, don't wanna forget Healing the Hood, Advanced Peace works as a part of this collaborative and we're striving to not work in silos and be on an island by ourselves. And that's very important. I'm glad you said that and I'm glad you reminded me. So shout out to Healing the Hood uh, and Moms Demand Action. Uh, we also need that, that ability to lobby and, and get at our legislators and, and make them aware that you know we need these investments and we want the cities and the state and everyone else to have skin in the game. Uh, I, I, that's really all I wanted to say, brother. Uh, Definitely didn't want to uh, forget the, to forget the collaborative piece That's right. and how it's so important for us to work together and not be in competition. You know, other than healthy competition, where where there's peace and 
and, and, and solidarity and we're galvanized in our effort to bring safety to these communities and bring awareness to this effort that we're trying to uh, reimagine public safety where our communities can be safe and we can see kids playing playing football in the streets, you know, again, you know, and not being worried about a car hitting the corner on two corners, on two wheels and being shot. We have so many situations where our young people are, are being killed. And it's so heartbreaking when you see a nine year old girl getting murdered by a stray bullet. So I definitely just wanted to bring back to bring back to the center of the stage, the collaborative effort. And that's all I wanted to say, brothers. Uh, Thank you. Let's love each other. Let's invest in our communities and let's work together and move forward in solidarity, brothers and sisters. And please visit the website, www um, community based public safety or our CBP um, S collective um, dot org and uh, download the report, read the executive summary, and then also watch for upcoming updates um, as we form this collective and move the work forward. Thank you all so much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Keela. Thank you, everybody. Peace, brothers. Right. Have a good day.